Welcome to another exciting podcast episode, this time featuring Dominic Spooner, the founder and CEO of Volta, a Brisbane-based battery casing technology company. With over 12 years' experience as a design engineer in diverse industries such as renewables, defence, aerospace and consumer goods, Dominic's mission is to revolutionise commercial battery use for efficiency, affordability and sustainability. His visionary leadership is driving Volta to redefine energy storage, making it greener and more innovative. Join us as we explore Dominic's vision in shaping the future of batteries. Hey guys, uh, welcome today to the podcast, The Off-Grid Tribe. Today we're talking to Dominic from Volta. So Dominic, tell us a bit about your company and yeah, where it all started. Yeah, Volta's been around a few years now. Most of it's been behind curtains, I'd have to say. Um, we started actually back in 2019 as a concept around uh, battery cell casing that doesn't use any welding um, and using composite materials that we were developing at the time as well. Uh, we entered a fairly interesting time as the rest of the world did in 2020 with as far as funding and, and getting some um, some ideas off the ground, but we were actually able to get a fair bit of R&D done during that sort of 2020, 2021 period. And we find ourselves now as a, a battery pack manufacturer, mostly in stationary storage. Um, yeah, we've got about six or seven full-time staff and a couple more part-timers as well. Um, yeah, so focus is uh, stationary energy storage, off-grid, uh, commercial, residential as well. Uh, so yeah, we're based in Brisbane. I guess what makes us a bit different is we we focus on being able to repair batteries down to the cell level uh, and including any other component that's inside that battery pack rather than sort of wasting a battery at a you know with if you have a, a failed cell. Yeah, cool. So look, most people listening to this are off grid. Tell us a bit more about the benefits of being able to repair a cell. Also, I suppose with that, there is the difference between being able to repair and welding. Like what's, what's the beneficial of having a battery that has no welds and being able to repair it? Process, obviously there's a reason why you weld a battery. It's, it's a good contact and it minimizes contact resistance. Um, but I guess the, the knock-on effect of doing that though, is that if you have a, a 16 cell pack, for instance, and you have a failed cell, um, it's highly likely that that whole pack then needs to turn into an end of life event. And there's benefits for both us and the customer as far as being able to replace a cell or replace a BMS. And that's um, a lot of it is driven by freight. Uh, there's only around a 5% lithium battery recycling rate worldwide at the moment. And that's pretty sort of damning statistic about what kind of designs are going into battery packs and, and just how difficult it is to get them out of, of where that, I guess that failure event takes place. But it, it's really important for us to not have any battery waste as we sort of sell these lithium or renewable energy battery packs because it, it sort of threatens the actual uptake of renewable energy overall. So it's largely to do with being able to only replace what you have to. So if you, instead of having a 100 kilo end of life battery pack, you might only have to replace a five kilo battery cell, which means five, you know, potentially 90 odd kilos less of dangerous goods that need to exit that facility. That's a, that's a yeah. big factor. And if we're talking about remote locations, for instance, uh, we can potentially set up uh, critical spares locations, send critical spares to customers as well, particularly in remote areas, meaning that rather than needing to send a technician uh, on a big travel journey to, to do that repair, we can actually commission that remotely through potentially skilled workers or eventually through the customer themselves um and have essentially less downtime yeah so being like in australia it's um you know less than lithium less than 20 kilos of lithium you can sort of put in a post pack and post it um so what you're sort of saying there is if a customer's battery cell one cell inside a battery has died you can literally post a cell out in australia post and have a qualified person come around to swap it over yeah within reason or, or have a i guess a base of um stock available to actually sort of make, minimize that that journey that that cell or that repair pack needs to take place so we would like to have you know critical spares available in essentially every capital city to minimize both time and the amount of freight that needs to take place for a for a failure event um, but you know put simply uh, if you put a five kilo battery into a hundred kilo uh, piece of geometry all of that becomes dangerous goods whereas uh, there's actually quite a lot of componentry that doesn't necessarily need to be considered dangerous goods. And if we do need to get a cell out of there and get that into recycling, then 
we'd like that to be only what needs to go into recycling rather than just broadly taking the entire unit and needing to, to work with that. Yeah. So you said that basically about 5% of batteries are recycled at the moment. So what happens to the rest that are not recycled? Yeah, I think there's a bit of a myth that there's a big landfill of lithium batteries. Um, that's not necessarily the space we're in. There is definitely lithium batteries that end up in landfill and you can see you know, plenty of examples of um, dump trucks sort of running over phone batteries and vacuum cleaner stick batteries uh, whilst they're in landfill and, and causing quite a lot of fire and, and problems there. More, more often than not though, we're talking about just excess storage. Um, if you're talking about a, a remote based battery there's a really good chance uh, based on current statistics that no one will know what to do with that battery and then it will just stay there or uh, in the other event there's you know plenty of warehouses and facilities that are housing end of life um, lithium batteries right now even in australia uh, and, and you know it's not saying that the lithium battery sort of transition is in its infancy stages but if we extrapolate the take up of evs and energy storage the way that we you know, are predicting to, you could end up with a huge amount of um, storage of end of life batteries that no one necessarily has much of an idea what to do with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of, um, like, it was one of the biggest things for me when I first started selling lithium based batteries. We, we stayed away from for a long time. Um, we used to sell a lot of nickel iron batteries. Uh, a lot of yeah. customers in the early days, and even still today, a lot of our customers are about longevity. They want, you know, they're permaculture based customers. So it's about, they want a battery that's going to be really sustainable. So we did lead acid because it was really recyclable. And I started looking to a few stories. And when you know, I first started really looking at the test, and I've seen some really cool things with the end of life Tesla batteries of people of from the cars, as an example. Um, you know, they've you know made home power systems or converted other EVs and things like that. And one of the things that I was told that a lot of the manufacturers are doing is they're taking back these lithium battery packs. And, you know, because a lot of the time that when they're end of life, they're not useful in the car, the car's range might have just gone from 400 down to 300 and someone wants a 400K range. And what I was told at that point in time, this is like back in 2017, they're actually taking those old Tesla packs back and recreating the battery packs for the stop signs for um, for schools and school zones. Um, so, yeah, so I've seen a lot of projects like that there where they're recycling them and reusing them and giving them another life um, in a different project, basically. I'd love to see more of that. Um, I would like to argue the best version of Volta enables a slew of companies to exist in that space because of our capability to disassemble fairly easily down to the cell level. So the perfect world, if we get a, a battery pack and we decide to end the battery pack's life, um, we may have eight cells that can go into a second life application. And whilst you know we, we may not necessarily have the application designed and ready to go, We'd really like there to be access to companies for, I guess, second life cells more often than there is at the moment. So it's at the moment to be able to, to get out, to get cells out of a battery pack. And, and a lot of my employees actually come from a background where they pulled battery cells out of vacuum cleaners and laptops and whatever they could get them out of. So when I explained that I wanted to do it in a way that doesn't use any, any welding or screws or glues, then it was a really sort of penny drop moment, I guess, for them to say, well, yeah, I, I understand that because I've, I've been in that space where I'm trying to pull batteries apart and it's it's really hard. Yeah. No, it definitely is. Well, a lot of think the um, Model 3 test is one of the early ones. It was very easy to pull the cells out and, and reuse them where a lot of the new ones, they glued them together and put a glue in. So literally, if there's one 18650 cell in there that was um, dead, it made the whole pack basically useless then because you had to... There's so much energy and effort to get all that glue off and pull it out and be able to reuse the rest of it. Yeah, so, there is there is a lot uh, involved in that. I mean, from an engineering perspective, I can see why that, that it's gone down that road because it's fire safety, it's easier to manufacture, it's it's kilowatts, kilowatt hours, you know, it's range and cost driven. And I can understand that, but it, it, it appears to be coming at the expense of repairability, which is obviously not necessarily aligned with what we do overall it's obviously still probably a better option than going out and buying a, a combustion engine vehicle but i think over the next several years we'd expect to see a lot more maturing of technologies that 
consider circularity, I guess, from the starting point, which is where we've come from, it is what is the ultimate result that we want? We don't want any battery waste from, from products that we produce. And we've had to work backwards from that to say, what, what does the design actually look like rather than how do we pull this thing apart at the end? No, totally. So you mentioned before, and, and I think it's a real common thing with um, with lithium that I, I don't really see with any other battery on the market is um, the warranty is always talked as end of life. So can you tell us a bit of reason, what's the reason that terminology is used? I think it's a little bit what you were talking about with um, uh, depth of discharge. Uh, so, you know, your range may be 400 down to 300, and that's probably a warranty condition that a lot of people consider. So that's performance metrics. Is the battery actually able to discharge that amount of power or discharge, you know, that, that capacity of power over a duration period? And that's often built into fairly large commercial agreements. Um, you know, we're, we're a relatively small company and still growing. So, you know, we're not necessarily entrenched into that commercial world just yet, but um, you know, we're, we're working towards that. And that's definitely, you know, what I'm pushing towards as a founder of the company is to get, get ready for big projects. But I think what it's, it's application specific. And, and I think depth of discharge appears to be the sort of driving factor. Can you get 400 kilometers out of the range of that battery anymore? If not, then it's considered to be either end of life or ready for decommissioning, at least for that first project. And hopefully, you know, as you start to see more companies like ours coming through that can disassemble and, and repair and reuse batteries, then that basically just commissions it to a new life. And that might be a, a backup system that only needs use case for say 30 seconds as a backup um, process, you know, in a data center, for instance, you don't need huge amounts of power. You just need it to be reliable and absolutely it's still reliable. It just doesn't have as much juice as it used to. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Now that, that makes sense. So, oh, and so, we talked about before is um people making decisions around batteries and i when i was flicking through your website and have a look um so i noticed there's a few different images of cylindrical cells versus prismatic cells and i i know you guys don't use pouch cells but can you give us a bit of a background of the different types of cells and if someone's at home trying to make a decision why would they go with something that's got a prismatic cell over a cylindrical cell or a pouch cell what's the benefits of each one yeah, I, I think they fall into application specific drivers. So I, I found at least for, from our perspective, prismatic batteries work well for stationary storage, um, in part because of geometrical factors, you put rectangular prisms into other rectangular prisms, and then put them into rectangular cabinets. So that helps. Um, but the other factor is reducing the number of cells that are in parallel. So we've got in those products that you've got on the screen there, all of the cells are in series. Uh, so 16 cells in series. What that, that, that means for us from the battery management perspective is that we can monitor every single cell. So once you go into uh, putting cells into parallel, which is much more common of a cylindrical cell pack, uh, you don't necessarily have a line of sight of what's happening for every single cell. So you, you kind of tend to group them into banks for monitoring with the BMS. And it is horses for courses. What I would say cylindrical cells are excellent at is producing high voltage products in small packages, obviously, because you put more cells in series and putting them into intricate shapes. So one of my earlier roles before I did Volta, actually where I got exposure to the uh, renewable energy and lithium industry is that we were designing these sort of intricate shapes with cylindrical cell battery modules. And if you wanted to pack as much energy density into a, an EV pack or a micro EV pack, you would kind of try and design them into we, uh, wheel arches and, and seat cavities and things like that. And I think cylindrical cells work really well for that. What I would say for stationary storage is you're looking for reliability, safety, um, and I guess cost effectiveness. And I think LFP and Prismatic seems to drive quite well into that. We don't necessarily do a lot with pouch batteries at the moment. I think, you know, the benefits of them is usually driven by weight. And if they need to go in a, into an application that needs to have structural um, safety, well, then you need to kind of over-design on the structural side to, to have that ready. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, so, yeah, well, 
I've had a few EV motorcycles and um, had the zero and it was a pouch cell. Um, and then the current bike I've got at the moment, yeah, it's, um, and I see a lot of the guys in the DIY world with the, with the motorcycles building these cruel, funky shapes to try and fit as much capacity on the bike as possible. And, um, you know, I was just, so yeah, I was talking to my mates on the weekend, we went riding together and, uh, we were talking about this military pack and, um, it was funny how the guys were, they were pretty scared of actually bolting this to their body where I was like, mate. I'd wrap it on me. I want extra range. Let's go. Um, so I think there's a lot of misconception of the with lithium of the dangers of it. So maybe you want to explain a bit more about the safety features and stuff with what what, what makes a, a lithium battery safe? How do you guys make it safe? Uh, the BMS has a really large role to play in that. So if you've got a really reliable battery management system with you know a good amount of safety sort of backups in, in that, that's that's a really good place to be. You know, I, I can empathise with someone who doesn't necessarily want to strap batteries to their chest. That's fine. Um, there's plenty of flame retardancy materials. Uh, stopping a lithium battery fire is obviously pretty difficult. But, um, you know, designing in flame retardancy materials, using best practices for um, fusing of the battery cells so that if one does start to heat up quickly, a certain amount of current will go into it and break that cell's contact from the rest of the battery pack. And most of these... I guess features are centered around buying you time and um you know with a lithium ion phosphate pack in particular you've probably got a bit more time than something that's like a nmc or a cobalt any any cobalt based battery um so that's generally why we go down that road with lfp particularly for stationary storage but for wearables anything that's weight specific you'll probably end up with a 2170 or an 18650 um and yeah, it's just about designing a pack that's suitable and not going to take any serious puncturing. So for defense, that's obviously quite critical when you consider, you know, bullets flying around, for instance, um, that you may not want to have uh, something, you know, in that where that event is potential to be carrying a battery on your chest. Whereas in a situation where maybe you're just uh, in transit when you need just more backup power or you might be... Um, you know, looking for that extra bit of juice to be able to charge your, your functions. What we know about, I guess, defense is that there, there's more and more battery power required on the body because of the, the amount of technology that the soldier does potentially wear these days. So, yes, they're safe, but only if they're treated with absolute caution during the design process and appropriately tested before sort of going out to scale. Yeah. So can you tell the listener at home of... um. So what does the 18650 and 21, yeah, the, what do those numbers actually mean for someone at home listening for the first time to understand yeah, what they're yeah. all about? Yeah, so 18650 is 18 millimetre diameter and 65 mil length for a cylindrical cell. 2170 is essentially the same metrics, 21 millimetres, 70 millimetres long. 26650 is another one. Prismatics tend to have a little bit more variation uh, in their sort of length and width and not necessarily driven by sizings. But um, 18650 is probably one of the more, uh, one of the first cabs off the rank. I think maybe Tesla did the first sets of studies around uh, what sort of energy density you can start to increase by using a larger format cell. So I think we're starting to see 4680s now as well um, coming from Tesla, which is 46 millimetre diameter, 80 millimetre length. Awesome. So it's just those numbers are just pretty much the size of the battery, the physical size of it. It, it is for those ones, yeah. With prismatics and pouch cells, um, it, it would be rarely sort of used. The, the dimensions would be rarely used in identifying the cell, uh, but certainly for cylindrical cells, that's that's an easy way to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, awesome. And so these ones here are what we call a rack mounted battery. Um, mm -hmm. And then you also go to a residential battery. So what, what's the difference here between a, a rack mounted battery and for someone listening at home of like, why would I look at a rack mounted battery over these residential batteries? What's the difference? Yeah, rack mount is really well suited to a situation where you may consider upgrading the size of the battery in the future. Um, it's another reason why we're using 48 volt batteries um, as a basically a standalone product at the moment. And the other reason is obviously safety. If we're getting in there and we're, potentially repairing, replacing battery cells. We'd prefer it to be at very low voltage, which 48 volts is. Um, the residential battery pack, that five kilowatt unit, I think 
I'm really quite excited about it because I think five kilowatts moves the needle for a large percentage of the Australian population. Maybe it's not grid independent or off grid purposed, but if you just want to just take the edge off those, those hours where the sun goes down, you get home in the afternoon, you cook, you use your hot water system or whatever it is you do, um, just to take the edge off that, that peak load that when you get home uh, in the afternoon, whether that be an air conditioner, for instance, um, you know, that we, we think that that battery size is, is going to help a lot of people in that sort of area. When we look at the rack mount versions, you know, if you're considering say 10 kilowatt hours plus, we would probably generally push someone towards the rack mount version because you can essentially put it in a cabinet, slide them in like drawers and say, okay, well, let's get a, a cabinet that allows for six of these. We don't need to get six right now, but it means that if we upgrade in the future, we can just simply use some of those allocated slots for those, for those racks. It's a bit more data center style, which is that traditional 19 inch rack. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting at the moment with energy prices that from a retailer, like someone sitting at home here listening that with the grid, and I think people realize that power prices have gone through the roof for most retail end users. And but the energy prices have actually come down so much during the day. Uh, I think there's a big misconception that renewables are actually making the grid more expensive. Um, when, you know, I'm on the wholesale market myself at home, I use a company called Get Local Vaults. It's actually a peer to peer program allows me to sell and buy my energy on the, you know, I can sell my energy to you in, in Queensland. Um, and when I'm not on that, I'm on the wholesale market. And yeah, prices of a day are really, really cheap. Like I think even right now, the prices are, um, it's one cent right now um, to buy energy from the wholesale market. So wow. the prices are really cheap of a day. And I think that five kilowatt hour battery um, from more from your residential style systems, it is the prices are really in what I've seen in the wholesale market. It's actually only for about 10 or 15 minutes, sort of between somewhere between 5.30 and 6.30 PM. And then all of a sudden sort of been 8.30 and 9.30 again at night where the prices are through the roof. And that sort of five kilowatt hours, you know, it is a great size because that's all we people need to do from a financial point of view is just get through those two short windows and be not buying at crazy prices. That's right. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, that's that's why we're we're pretty excited about the use case of that product. Um, you know, we've we've spent some time to to give it some uh, more aesthetic appeal, I guess, than a rack mount style battery. Uh, it's a little bit more standalone. Um, you know, we've designed it with the installer in mind as well. So it's quite a quite a straightforward install without necessarily needing to to pick anything heavy up. Um, so our 14 kilowatt hour battery, for instance, is about 95 kilograms. So we've had to consider that design uh, quite intimately when when working out how to get it from our, our warehouse, for instance, to to an installation, whereas this one's a little bit easier to manage and a little bit more installer friendly. Yeah, definitely. And I think at the end of the day as well for, um, you know, I, I learned back in 2016 when I did my Tesla training, I went along for it the first day and I really realized at that point in time that Tesla's customer was actually the installer. And that was the number one priority for them is to make sure the installer is happy, their life is easy because if their life is easy and they like the product, they would then push it onto their customers and get them to do it. And I think that's why... Tesla's really dominated, not that it's the best product on the market. It's just that for the installers, it's a really quick, easily in install. And yeah, they can just move on with life, whack on the wall. And look at Tesla Powerwall these days, the guys, if the locations are close enough, can punch two to three out a day, uh, you know, in the one street. Yeah. Couple of yeah. guys, so. yeah, look, it, people, we get asked about Tesla quite often. And, you know, it would be foolish for me to say that they're a competitor of ours. That's like, you know, that's not, not a real comparison. So. They're, they're the opportunity, I guess, because they're the they're the driver for the industry for so so much of it. So so much of people's or the consumers' exposure to the renewable energy energy industry is through that brand, and um, I, I think that has probably paved the way for a lot of other companies. Yes, they're a massive company. Maybe there's you know misconceptions about quality, or people have certainly have feelings about. Um, Elon Musk uh, is, is what I've found as well. But overall, you need to have um, a respect for, I guess, what, what's being paved because of that company. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, they've definitely um, definitely done some great marketing for the industry to get people looking at batteries and making that consideration. And yeah, so. I just think the, the buyer experience from some of those products is, is something 
uh, that's been adopted, I guess, from some of that more consumer world process. And, you know, there's probably some correlation between how people interact with Apple products and, and whatnot and how, I guess, simplifying that journey and that buyer's experience to just sort of getting energy. Ultimately, people just want energy, right? They don't necessarily yeah. have a huge uh, opinion on inverter models. Uh, I mean, I know off-grid people do, but certainly on-grid standard, you know, if you're buying or building a house, maybe it's not up there in the sort of top categories of things you think about. Yep. No, definitely. So, so your battery is a, a communications battery. Um, can you explain to the people at home listening what's the benefits of having a battery that has comms in it? Um, so, and with that there, so can, you know, on the Victron as an example, can you see that data cell level on through the Victron? You can't see the cell level data. We're working on that at the moment um, behind closed doors, but it is coming soon. Uh, we, we get basically full understanding of what a system is happening through that Victron um, protocol. So we've spent a good amount of time um, making our uh, CAN bus communications communicate uh, appropriately to the Victron system so that, um, you know, if the inverter is asking for power, that the battery will communicate a little bit more detail about what, you know, how much power it has left rather than just saying, I'm mean, out, I can't give you any more. Uh, and that's the best way that I can explain the communications in, in layman's terms. It's not necessarily my area of specialty as well. I have to say that's a, something that's you know, very much entrenched in a couple of the engineer, engineers at our, our office that have really upskilled in that space. I think if you're using lithium batteries, you need a battery management system. I think that's, a, that's not a nice to have. It's a must have. Um, and it's probably one of the key differences between um, lead acid systems to lithium is that because of the volatility or potential safety um, repercussions of lithium, you must have that BMS. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, from my experience over the years of dealing with customers and like I can see both sides where a lot of, you know, companies go, I don't want a communications battery, I just want a dumb battery. And even with lithium with a BMS, they don't want to send the comms off because, you know, that does itself can cause issues. But on the other hand, you know, even this week, I just had a warranty job on a battery where we had to, literally pull it out, send it back. They got it. They tested it. And they said, yep, it's a warranty job. We'll send you a new one where, you know, for us, we've gone to site, tested it, pulled it out, shipped it off. They have their opinion on it and then do it where a battery with communication straight away, we can log in remotely and go, yep, the battery said there's a, a faulty cell, replace it. So we're only going to site once really and removing the battery and swapping it all over in one go, which is, um, which has been great. So yeah, yeah. I'm a big yeah. fan of, comms in batteries and better see what's going on well, i think for for us as a manufacturer of those batteries as well having i guess access to that that information um is a good way to de-risk i guess scaling of our manufacturing um, facility as well if we the more batteries that we have out there the more we want to be able to monitor monitor i guess just the health and safety and and performance of those batteries to I guess, drive activities that we do within the business, whether we, you know, update designs, start to explore other um, cell chemistries uh, for, for certain applications. You know, lithium titanate seems to have a, a really good application towards stationary storage in the future as well. Um, so, you know, that, that information allows us to continue to try to make the best product. Yeah. So, so with your product then, um... That's a really good point. I'm a really big fan of lithium titanate. Um, I got excited about lithium titanate back in 2012. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a few people in Australia that actually do it. I just don't think they do it well. And I think, yeah, I would love to see that sort of product. So is that something Volta would be looking at of offering different technologies rather than just the LFP batteries and looking at different things like the mm -hmm. LTO cells? Yeah, yeah, in the future for sure. Um, I wouldn't say it's on the, the critical path at the moment, but... Um, yeah. It does come into consideration when we're talking about uh, further developments of the battery management system is being able to accept different types of chemistries because ultimately you just want you know to be able to deliver more power in a smaller package uh, that's that's a, a natural progression for the industry but you need to consider life cycle repairability recyclability all of those things along the way what i would say is recyclability and repairability is is this must have application for anything that we do it's the sort of overarching umbrella it's not an afterthought it's not one element of the process it's essentially 
the kind of driving cog of how we design a battery at all times. No, definitely. Yeah, it's, um, you know, anything like I'm really passionate about sustainable buildings, you know, that's we're doing off grid over the years. It's a really spent a lot of time with my customers say, look, it's about designing the house right. We designed the house right. We've got a smaller solar system and things just seem to work a lot better. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's that design to start with and from day one of, you know, we can solve so many problems in the world with, with the right kind of design. I think with what Volt is doing and what you've been doing here with that is that designing that battery pack of how to deal with issues as they arise in the future rather than just throw the whole thing in the bin and start again. Yeah, it's not a new concept, I'd have to say. <laughs> um, you know, we haven't reinvented the wheel by making something repairable. Uh, you know, it's really prominent in Europe, that right to repair um, movement or that design for disassembly process. Um, it, it seems to have not necessarily taken off in batteries just yet because it's a relatively early, um, it's still relatively early stages for the battery and renewable industry. Whereas, you know, a lot of those, I guess, white, white goods and, and uh, appliances that have, have been used for years and years, people are using, people want to be able to repair that. I think once you sort of treat a, a lithium battery pack similar as a white good or an, an appliance, so to speak, then you should have every right and um, desire to want to repair what you can to minimize the waste. Yep, no, totally. No, totally. So if, if I'm sitting at home thinking, okay, well, you know, and it's one of the biggest things for people to make decisions around batteries. If I was someone looking to make a choice with Volta, like who, who's Volta's ideal customer? Yeah, Volta, I, I would have to say an off-gridder is really sort of right up there on our list at the moment. Um, we've been doing a number of off-grid projects and uh, we love the customer profile. We, we love that a lot of them are, are very technical and can bring, I guess, their experiences to the table because we can learn from that as well. In the future, we'll, we will definitely push more towards the, the sort of new home build, five kilowatt hour residential battery pack, um, you know, ready to go off the shelf. And I think there's a large number of people that are contacting us on a regular basis about that battery. Uh, and, and we're, you know, really scrambling to try and get that, that sort of at a production level now um, because, you know, we've got the demand. So we're really excited about the future of that. But the ideal customer at the moment for us would, would have to be the um, the off-gridders. I'm really quite, uh, I enjoy the conversations with the off-grid customers as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, I've been doing off-grid pretty much the whole time, been involved in the industry. And it's one of the things for me, it is it is a completely different conversation having with someone because you're talking about, you know, it's, I get excited about you talking about how you're going to heat your hot water, how you're going to cook, how you're going to do all these things. Um yeah. When you're in a world, you're going to do it in the middle of the day or of a night and that sort of stuff. So it's a complete different conversation instead of, um, you know, this is my bill. I want to return on my investment, make it happen, you know. Uh, totally. you yeah, it. digging a bit deeper. Yeah, it's, it's really um, maybe it's just that sort of process of uh, understanding human behavior a little bit more and that I have a design background. That's my that's what I studied. So I guess understanding what people do with their with their life. And, and how they interact with with products is is essentially you know that's my that's my skill so getting insights into how people interact with power and energy is is always interesting for us and and i know i i would think the engineering group that we have um, inside the company would echo that statement as well awesome awesome so mate, so what's next for volta what, what, what can we expect to see in the future yeah, we're, we're scaling at the moment. So really excited about bringing, I guess, a bit more capacity to the company. We're, we'll be doing some more hiring. Um, you know, we're, we're generally in that startup phase, but I'd like to think we're sort of just just over the hump of, of the, um, you know, the, the true startup phase and we can start to look at scaling up appropriately and having products that are suited towards larger scale applications as well. We want to get you know, big enough to start being able to do some of these government tenders. I think there's a big push towards Australian made product. Um, and for what it's worth, I think what we make is is about as Australian made as you can possibly get at the moment. And, and it's designed in a way that can start to incorporate more Australian made product as that comes online, like battery cells and, and different types of technologies. Um, yeah, so scaling is probably the name of the game at the moment. And then, you know, I've got I harbour desires to be able to bring recycling under the, the Volta banner as well. 
Um, I think that's only only right that we would bring that sort of in in house as well. That we can start to you know if there is a battery that that ends its life, then we need to be able to manage that ourselves. Um, maybe not necessarily at the scale of of a, of a commercial grade recycler. You know, we we just want to see more recycling put it that way. But um, yeah. you know we want to be able to manage some of that ourselves, just to show that we we have a real true understanding of where the battery starts what happens in the middle and then how it ends. And we, we generally want to be in control to make sure that there's no battery waste uh, chance uh, at any stage. Yeah, totally. I think, you know, I, I would love to see to bring back and panels is a big thing for me that um, I would love to see bring back the days where it's a bit like the old milk bottles where the manufacturer is responsible for the waste because there's so many solar panels that go to waste right now. And uh, I've even had these thoughts that, on the way in when panels are sold and I look at the end of the day it's um the consumer is the one that ends up paying for it is the reality um but there should be a fee paid um by a manufacturer on the way in then when the panels recycled or thrown in landfill um you know the the companies that have more panels that go on the landfill should pay fines basically um their panels you know yeah. like I love REC is my favorite panel on the market and has one of the lowest failure rates um of any panel made and they're made in Singapore. They get a really good production process over there. And um, that's a big thing for me. Any products we've ever sold over the years, we, we want to know about the embodied energy and the whole cycle life of every single product. So when um, when I was told about your product, I was, I was pretty excited to have this conversation and, and learn more about the product because it's um, companies like yours that we really are excited about letting the world know about, understand. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah, it's... Um... It, it's, it's great that people are starting to understand the benefits of circularity rather than considering it to be an afterthought. Um, and again, you know, uh, what we're seeing is the customer is, is finding this information out potentially themselves, and then they scratch the surface and realize, actually, there's not, not everyone is, is paying attention to this problem. So whilst we can broadly consider batteries to be better than the alternative in a lot of applications, but let's not, let's not create a new problem as we do it. Let's yep. consider how we can be the best at this process. We're in a very sort of unique stage for the human race as we transition to renewables that we've got a really good opportunity to get it right and not end up with you know, more problems in the, in the future. And you know, boring old lead acid batteries are recycled at about 98% worldwide. So it can be done and it, it shows that there's you know, every every chance for us to increase that recycling percentage for lithium batteries as well. They're so valuable and what goes into them is so valuable that we're crazy to not necessarily consider that to be something we should want to be wanting to extract back out again. Yep. No, totally. So um yeah, get a system a bit like the old aluminium cans and um and lead acid batteries. <laughs> There, there is a push, yeah. Certainly battery stewardship. So um the ABRI is is um uh pretty front and center of that. I'm actually speaking at an event about battery recycling next week in Sydney. Exciting. Good stuff. So get us a copy of that, mate. We can share it with our audience uh, once you've done it. So awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, thank you. Um, yeah, so well, thank you. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge and your information. And um, we'll put all the links down below to all the Volta and be able to contact Dominic if you have any questions and things like that. And um, yeah. Appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your experience and your story. Yeah, much appreciated. Thanks for your time, Mike. All right, mate. Thank you. All the best. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found the content educational and inspiring. If you got something out of it and you think you know someone else that would actually also enjoy it, we'd really appreciate it if you could share the link with them and encourage them to check out our channel. And don't forget you can join the Off Grid Tribe podcast for free. We can actually ask and interact with myself and also our guest speakers. So jump over today to the offgridtribe.com, register yourself an account. We can actually have a conversation with myself and one of our guest speakers and we can continue the conversation there. Together, let's embrace the power of sustainable living.